Hello, and welcome to our sound for video session. Just double checking, doing an audio check there. We have, uh, I think we're sounding good. If anyone could give me a thumbs up just to confirm that out on the stream we're sounding okay. And um, we're going to go ahead and jump in. And we've got a good number of questions that were submitted ahead of time tonight. So we'll take a look at those and then we'll come back to the chat here and we'll take a look at those as well. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I think it's actually good to kind of uh, spend some of our time doing this, at, get our minds off of some of the other stressful things going on at the moment. So uh, thanks for joining. So let me just switch over to the questions here. All right, sound is good. Thumbs up, sounds fine. Thumbs up, thumbs up. Thank you, everybody. Okay. All right, first question is from Klaus. He asks, I am thinking about getting a Zoom H4n Pro to do some walk and talk interviews for a podcast. I think the Zoom and some decent lobs can do the job, but will the Zoom also be able to drive an NTG5 if I want to do some sound effects recordings? Let's pause there. A um, couple of thoughts there. So yes, I think that the Zoom H4n would work okay for an NTG5. NTG5 doesn't need a ton of gain, so that would be fine. I would be more concerned about which lavaliers you're going to be able to hook up to that. Um, so the Zoom H4n has a single 3.5 millimeter input and two XLR uh, combination input jacks. So most lavaliers are going to have 3.5 millimeter TRS, so you can get one in there for sure on that. Um, and then the other one will have to probably be a, you, you can go a couple ways. You could create a splitter and, and walk down that path and, and plug two 3.5 millimeters into that. Well, could you? I'm not sure it's a stereo input. I think it is a stereo input. Um, or you could get one that's an XLR or two that are XLR based lavalier microphones. Those are a little bit more, those are a little more difficult to come by. There aren't a ton of them out there, but you can find some. Sony makes some. Uh, most of the pro level ones, the pro level lavalier microphones, you can get with XLR terminations as well. Um, so there's some options there, but just be aware that the the more affordable lavalier options, um, there aren't very many with XLR. So just one thing to consider there. But yeah, I think fine, it would work fine with an NTG5. Next question: Can it even drive an SM7B without any sort of booster cloud lifter? That's going to be way trickier. <laughs> I think you're going to be pushing the H4n pretty hard uh, to make that work. It just doesn't provide that much gain. And the SM7B, of course, is a very gain-hungry microphone. So that would be a tough one. You might be able to get by maxing out the gain and then boosting it in post, but I'm um, that probably wouldn't be my first choice. As far as recorders in that price range... Um, Back when I was using the Tascam DR60D Mark II, that one did a decent job at, uh, it seemed like it, it could provide a little bit more clean gain than, um, than the Zoom H4n Pro, but it's still, it's still a little bit of a, a stretch with an SM7B. That's just a tough one. That's one where probably with those lower end recorders, you probably would probably, you that's a lot of probabilities. You probably will want to look at some sort of cloud lifter or fat head or something like that, a microphone activator, as they call them. Um, I'm curious what other people think would be good options in the around $200 recorder, field recorder range. Um, I I had kind of a bias toward the Tascam DR60D Mark II. Um, if I had that choice between that and the Zoom H4n Pro, I probably would have opted for the Zoom, or the sorry, the Tascam. But I'm curious what other people's thoughts are on that as well. So I think it can be fine for the NTG5. It can be fine for lavalier microphones. Um, but you'll you'll probably want to do some work and figure out which lobs you want to use out that. So, all right, Klaus, thanks for that question. All right, uh, next up, let's do a, just a little switch over here so you can see this screen. All right, next up from Dan, is there a way to keep the metadata track names when using Wave Agent to split the files. And here he's talking about polywave files that are recorded with multiple tracks. He has a Sound Devices Mix Pre 10, and I name each track Boom, Love One, etc. After splitting the tracks up in Wave Agent, the names disappeared. Well, let's just take a look at that then. First of all, here I have Wave Agent. I have imported a file. This is super small. Sorry about that. The UI just isn't made for, for live streaming. But there is a file here, and you may or may not be able to see because it's so small. Uh, there is 
uh, a name field here which identifies the metadata name for each of those tracks. So I called one boom and one lav one, just like you did. Now, what I did was I came up here to the window menu, choose split combine. I tapped on the split poly tab. And what I did here is I set it up, you can actually clear this. I set it up so that track number one would go to file one and track number two would go to file two. So we're just basically splitting this file up. Went ahead and processed it. And I opened it up in Adobe Audition, which looks like this. And you can see here, when I brought these in, the names of the tracks were retained. So I have Boom and Love One. So I think, um, Dan, my question for you is which app are you using to view the files once you have split them up because it looks like wave agent actually retains that metadata in there so um, if you want to follow up and just send me some more information on that maybe we can track that down but it's a good question and hopefully that gets you some information to keep you going all right next up from will having watched pretty much all of your reviews of mics i'm interested and in, i think i got a decent idea of how to select a mic for spoken word and dialogue thanks for all the valuable content you share with the community I'm not sure, however, if the same approach would work for selecting a mic for recording ambient noise. I think you mean ambient sound, <laughs> like nature, and isolating quieter nature sounds. Would you be able to share any insights on how to select a mic for this purpose? All right, Will. Absolutely, that is a fantastic question as well. And that's not one that we've spent quite as much time on. So let me just give you some thoughts on that. First of all, I think it really depends on what you're trying to capture. So first question, are you doing a mono uh, ambient sound recording or are you doing stereo? That's the first question. Second, are you going to have full control or well, are you going to want to record everything or do you want the recording to be somewhat directional? And the reason I ask that is so for example, if you've got a road say 20 meters behind you, you probably don't want to pick up that sound. Probably, I'm, I'm assuming if you're going to record nature sounds. So you're going to want a setup that's somewhat directional at least. So you will reject the road noise behind you and pick up just the nature sound. So that's another question to ask yourself. Um, a lot of times, if you're going to be doing stereo recordings, uh, being able to purchase a microphone that you can buy in a stereo pair, a matched pair, may be worthwhile, may be worth considering as well, because then you'll know that their frequency response will be similar to one another. So that's another consideration. So I would typically, um, for most cases, for example, if you want sort of a uh, capture of an ambient soundscape, my thinking is you'd probably want a, a stereo pair of microphones, and you would want those microphones to probably be car probably have cardioid polar patterns, just so you can control a little bit the direction that you're picking things up from. <clears throat> um, so those are the those are the two things that I would think about first. Um, you'll also want something you can mount if you're going to be using it outdoors, obviously for nature sound, something that you can mount inside of a, uh, some sort of wind protection. So that's going to be cons a consideration as well. And there are a number of different options there. I know that Rycote, um, makes several of their, some of their Cyclone, um, they make in a stereo configuration. So you can actually put stereo microphones inside of those. Um, I believe that, uh, what's the name of that other company? <clears throat> excuse me, they may come some of the really higher end um, wind covers. I think the Pianissimo is their, one of their, I think that's a product name, not the, not the company name. In any case, there's another company out there that makes them as well. They're a lot more expensive. They're very nice. <laughs> They're like the Cadillac, if you will, or the high end. Um, but those are some considerations there. So there are some things to look for there. I would you know, again, not knowing all of the details of what you're trying to do and whether you're trying to be uh, trying to isolate the sound at all. But that's one thing. Again, then if you're going to be doing something where you're trying to isolate quieter nature sounds and you want a, a much more directional polar pattern, that's where I think a shotgun microphone is probably a good choice. And depending on how far away the sound source will be from you, and in nature, if you're talking about wildlife, sometimes they can be a long way away. Uh, you may want to look at least at one of the medium length shotgun microphones, or if you're going to be quite a, quite a distance away, then you might want to look at um, either a long shotgun microphone. Sennheiser makes one. I believe it's the, is it the 816? I, I don't remember exactly the model number on that, but then there's also the Rode NTG8, 
which is worth considering, which again, long shotgun microphone, it gives you more reach. And what I mean by that is it just has a more um, focused polar pattern. So you can kind of aim it and dial in exactly the particular sound you're trying to capture and reject a lot of the other ambient sounds. So that's a consideration if you're gonna do more of that type of work. Another possibility if you are working from a significant distance is also to consider um, larger parabola microphones. It's essentially you put a lavalier microphone in the center of a dish and you're able to aim the dish. They use these a lot on the sidelines in uh, sporting events. And uh, that can help you kind of capture a distant uh, nature sound as well. So those are some considerations there, Will. Um, most of the time when I'm doing, for example, Foley sound, I'll almost always use a shotgun microphone. When I have done ambient recording, I've just used a stereo microphone pair. I use the Rode TF5 because that's a, the set that I happen to have, which were actually made for music recording, <laughs> but they work quite nicely for uh, soundscape, nature soundscapes as well. Um, I do not have a wind cover for outdoors, so I can only work in my current setup on days where there's basically no wind, um, So, which is not very often. <laughs> So those are some considerations there, Will. Thanks for thanks for the question there. All right, let's get back to the questions here and see what else we've got. Next up from Christy. Luckily, and with a lot of persistence, I learned how to make basic mode work with some camcorders, microphones, and headphones. So she's speaking here just for context. Um, Christy is taking the Sound Devices Mix Pre course, and she's speaking, I think, specifically about the Mix Pre 6. My question is, how do I get channel 5 and 6 to work in basic mode? Well, let's take a look at that. The way we get that to work, I'm going to come over here and then switch over to the overhead cam. Let's get this turned on. So I don't have a Mix Pre 6 on hand. I do have a Mix Pre 10. So we're going to fire this up, and it's basically the same here. So this will show us how things work. All right, on this particular one, instead of five and six, and you're talking about this 3.5 millimeter auxiliary input over here, that's channel five and six on your Mix Pre 6. Now, to use that, there are a few things you have to set up. So first of all, let's just make sure that we are in basic mode, and we are, so we're good there. And then what I do is I come into the inputs menu, and the first thing I check is this aux in mode. That refers to this auxiliary input, and you get to choose what you're going to bring in on that auxiliary input. And I'm assuming you're going to bring in a microphone. So we're going to go ahead and tap microphone. And then we can go back. And then on yours, you should have a channel 5 and a channel 6 screen menu item. If you tap that, one of those, that then takes you basically into the pre-fade or listen menu, the menu that you get when you press the button here, and allows you to change the settings. So for example, for track 9, we come to input and we're going to turn that on and we're going to choose aux in one. So what we're telling it is for input number nine, or in your case, input number five, you want to take the left side of this 3.5 millimeter stereo auxiliary input. Go ahead and, oh, whoops, it's, no, no, there it switched. Now I can go ahead and set the gain. I can pan it left or right. I can turn the low cut on and all the regular settings that I would have in basic mode. And then I can come back here into the input menu and do the same thing for channel 10 except that when I turn this on, looks like my option is aux in two. So that's the second part of this stereo auxiliary input. I can select that. Then I can go ahead and set the gain. I can choose the pan right or left, and I can turn the low cut on, just like, again, you normally have all those controls. So that, Christy, is how you turn on and access uh, input five and six, the 3.5 millimeter mic input on the side of your Zoom, or sorry, your <laughs> Mix Pre 6. Uh, so there's that. All right, switching back then over to the question. You had a follow-up question here as well. Is there a, a way I need to adjust the headphones in basic mode? I couldn't find it, but it seems to work just adjusting the volume. And I would say, you know, if you've got, if yeah, if you're adjusting the volume and that's working for you, that's all you really need to do. You don't need to have a special headphone preset in basic mode. Um, basic mode is only recording a stereo mix, not individual uh, microphone channels. And so, you know, generally you're not going to do any sort of specialized, well, let me think about that. I don't think you're generally ever going to want to do any sort of specialized headphone routing or presets on that. So uh, probably a stereo is working if that's all you need. And so I just leave it as is, in other words. So, all right. Thanks for that question, Christy. I hope that helps. 
And then finally, a very long one. <laughs> um, let me just run through. I'll read this here for you. It's a pretty small one, so um, small in terms of the type size. I've been very much tempted by the Mix Pre 6. And let me just give you some background here on Felix. Felix is um, asking in the context of someone who does podcasting. So he's asking here that he, he's saying here, I'm tempted by the Mix Pre 6, but I have the nagging feeling that I don't need the compact sound bag form factor or the all-in-one mixer recorder functionality. I appreciate the fast setups, but my recordings are mostly semi-stationary and I don't need to move as quickly as you do on set, so I think I can deal with a laptop capturing the audio. Also, I'm a bit concerned about the extensibility of the Mix Pre, which looks like it won't integrate very well with ex external equipment. In contrast, for example, to the Sound Devices Pro models that offer digital I.O., but those are entirely out of my budget range. It might be hubris, but I wonder whether I'm going to want to add more channels at some point and be stuck with the same dilemma in a few years. Let's pause there. I want to talk about that for just a minute. Um, Felix, so just, just a couple thoughts on that, first of all. Um, you actually can, ex I mean, the, the Mix Pre, depending on which one you get, you can expand. We actually just talked about um, the thing that we showed here for Christy on the Mix Pre. You can actually use that auxiliary input as a line level input from a mixer, for example, if you wanted to add more channels. So it is extensible from that standpoint. No, it does not have a digital input, but it does have an input that you could hook up another uh, mixer that has an additional set of um, microphone inputs. So if you needed to add additional inputs, you could do that. Now, you're talking specifically about the Mix Pre 6. One thing I want to underscore is that that has four XLR TRS combination inputs. And then the five and six are that 3.5 millimeter auxiliary input. So realistically, if you're going to have um, five people or six people, then you're not going to have a dedicated input for each of those people, a dedicated XLR input, I should say, at least. So even at that point, you would need to have um, some sort of mixer or some other way to feed those two additional mics into the 3.5 millimeter input. So just some thoughts. Um, let's switch back over to the question and keep going here. So I've been looking around for alternatives that might be not might not be as compact, but might scale a bit if necessary. For example, I've been looking at the Octopre series, which provides ADAT, SPDIF, I.O., and could, in my understanding, be routed together and used as a USB interface via the RME Digiface. So just for those that don't know all the, the lingo here, <laughs> um, SPDIF is a um, is a digital interface for sending audio. And I believe it's optical, so it has very little latency. Um, and then RME Digiface is, I believe, an, an audio interface. I'm not particularly familiar with that model, if, that's, if that is a model, but I assume that's an, an audio, a USB audio interface. And it has this SPDIF input, so this optical input for bringing in additional channels of audio. So if your, I would say this, Felix, if your requirement is that it must be digital audio, then yes, you're right. The mix pre is out. Um, so that's a consideration. All right. So you said here, for example, an Octopre plus an RME Digiface, the price together would be about the same as a mix pre six. You give up the compactness of the mix pre and would need to carry a computer with you for recording, but it feels like a more sustainable solution in the long term. I also like the Dante equipment that you've been demonstrating for the same reason. Then again, six channels are easily enough for what I'm planning right now. I've needed three or four, maybe five max, and it's very unlikely I'm going to need routing capability. And I would love to have auto mix. <laughs> All right, let's just, uh, there, there's a whole bunch there to unpack, but we'll come back to that. My question to you in the community, I guess, are these. From your experience with both voice and music recording, do you think it's worth investing in more channels than you can fill? Would you still get a mix pre if you dropped the portability requirement, thinking in terms of a small rack case instead of a sound bag? Can you recommend a direction to start looking for equivalent, uh, sorry, evaluating alternatives? For example, do you know of an affordable Dante I.O. box of similar quality to the mix pre? Okay, coming back out of there. There is a lot to unpack there. So um, if, here's a very simple thing. If auto mixing is at the top of your requirements list, then a mix pre is a great option. I don't know of any audio interface that has autom automatic mixing 
that I've heard of. Maybe there are some out there, but I've never heard of any of them. Um, I don't know how you produce your podcast right now or if you have yet, but I find Automix to be extraordinarily an extraordinarily time-saving tool in post. So if you need to turn around things pretty quickly or you just don't have a ton of time to invest in doing the post work, Automix can be a, an, an amazing tool. And again, I don't know of any post tools. Well, I do know of one post tool. Um, one thing that can potentially do an auto mix for you is Auphonic, an online tool. Actually, they have a downloadable version too. I don't know if the download version has an auto mix feature. I've never used it, but I've heard people talk about it. So it's just something I haven't checked out yet. That could potentially replace that. That's something to look into if that's uh, something that's important to you. So first of all, the question about, do you think it's in, worth investing in more channels than you can fill? I don't generally think so. If you have a plan for what you're going to do, if you do find yourself in that situation, then I think having an external input, you know, just again, like the Mix Pre here has this 3.5 millimeter input where you can take a line level signal. I would have no qualms about doing that. It's not digital, but it's, uh, you know, with the Mix Pre, it's very high quality. So you're using... You know, you're all you're you're using the same analog to digital converters. So you're sending a line level signal that's already amplified from a mixer, an external mixer, and there are lots of those out there with with some great quality preamplifiers. Um, so I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily insist on digital as an interface to expand, um, especially if you're considering the mix pre. But if you know if you do want the um, you know USB interface and you know, the Octopri and the RME Digiface could be a, a solution as well. You're just going to not have the auto mix feature. Um, in terms of investing in additional channels, I, I, I've I played that game myself mentally. And I will say that on my last interface, I bought an Apollo Universal, uh, Universal Audio Apollo X6. That only has two microphone inputs because in my previous interfaces, I had... I think my previous one had like 10 inputs and I never used more than two. And if I needed more than two, then I used something else like a mix pre. And it was, uh, you know, that that's, I, I think there are ways to solve that problem. I feel like a lot of us have a tendency to say, well, what if in the future I'm going to have 18 channels? Well, that's pretty rare. So maybe just make sure you have an input and, and move on from there is my thinking. Now, on the other hand, if you are regularly going to have five people in your podcast, then you, a mix pre six is probably not the right answer, unless you're going to go ahead and invest in that mixer at the same, you know, an external mixer that you'll hook into it at the same time, even that, eh, you know, at that point, I almost feel like a mix pre 10 would be a better option for you. You'd have eight microphone dedicated XLR inputs, plus you'd still have the 3.5 millimeter if you did need to bring more than eight in which if you're doing more than eight, that's a big job. Um, and then you'd have your auto mix feature. That, that, this is all my bias. So anyone in the, in the chat there, go ahead and tell us how you feel about this as well. But those are some of my thoughts there. I, if you're, you have to be really honest with yourself. If you're regularly going to have five people, then yes, get something that can handle five natively. So you don't have to mess with all this additional gear. Here's one thing I can say for sure. What I have found in many cases is that if you're doing this for yourself, you're say you're not getting you know directly paid for producing this stuff. I have found that when you don't have the gear, well, if a, if an opportunity arises and it's going to be a lot more work and you have to pick up you know and connect more gear, getting the motivation to do that. I don't know what you're like, Felix, but I notice that sometimes, for me, it's always like uh, just even mentally, there's this like uh, it's a bigger setup. It's going to take more time. Um, so that's the one thing I would caution you against in, you know, having a complex setup. So on the other hand, if you're always going to bring your guests into a studio where this gear is always going to be set up, then it's not as big of a deal. So there's that. Um, the Mix Pre is not a good option to put in any sort of rack. And here's why I say that. The Mix Pre, um, a rack, rack mount gear typically has all the controls on the front and all the inputs and outputs and power on the back nothing on the sides. Mix Pre has a bunch of stuff on the sides, no matter which version you get. So it is not made for racks. So if you are going to put it in some sort of rack, I do not recommend a Mix Pre. I would go with the other stuff instead. So there is that. Um, 
I, you know what I would do, Felix? I would recommend you put, you force yourself to list the priorities for what you need. Put them in order. You cannot have two things at the same number. You have to choose your number one priority and put it at number one, then your number two priority, so on and so forth. And I think that'll help drive you towards a solution that's going to work for you. Um, it's also not the end of the world. If something doesn't work out and you bought a Mix Pre, they're pretty easy to sell, especially if you buy a Mix Pre 2. It's the current version. If you needed to sell it because you found it just wasn't working for you, then you could do that. Or if you bought the Octopre and the RME and it didn't work out for you, you can probably sell those as well and not lose your entire investment. So that's another thought as well. Do you know of an affordable Dante IO box of similar quality to the Mix Pre? Just, I, I, I haven't uh, spent a lot of time in the Dante world, so... Um, we reviewed the uh, Matrix from Here Technologies a couple weeks ago, or was it last week? And that's only a two input, so I don't know. You know, typically the Dante I.O. boxes are going to be like 16 inputs. <laughs> um, they're generally stage boxes. You can probably get one that's eight. Um, there are a lot of different companies out there. Um, I My mixer is a Allen & Heath, and so that was the one I was looking at, but I think that's a six. I, I don't, can't remember if they have an eight input or if it's only a 16 input, but those um, those are possibilities, I suppose. Um, so, I don't know. I feel like maybe maybe I've beat that one to death. Let's go ahead and take a look at the comments here and see what all of you have to say about that as well. So that's a, the totality of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. All right. Well, okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and address this uh, question here. We've got a good, lot of comments here um, about the mix pre, this last question from Felix. Um, actually, no, let, we're going to go back to the start just to keep my keep myself sane, <laughs> make sure that we don't miss anything here. All right, so we have a bunch of hellos. First of all, Scott asks, um, let's pop this up on the screen here for everybody. I do production sound, but a lot of clients are looking for post-production audio editors. I'm pretty much invested in Resolve. I know you like Adobe Audition. Is Fairlight a viable option? Of course it is. If it's working for you, it certainly is a viable option. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, to be honest, the main reason I'm still using Adobe Audition, I, and I still haven't had an opportunity to get into the 16.2 version of Resolve yet to look at the new Fairlight panel, but um, Adobe Audition, for me, part of the reason that I use that is for education purposes, that waveform editor is a really good way to illustrate how different effects work. And that's a big part of the reason why I've, I stick, I hold on to it and I still use it. Um, but I do have Pro Tools as well, and I've got Fairlight and DaVinci Resolve. So um, I've used all of them, and I think they're all viable options. Also, bummer that NAB is canceled. Are you up for any other shows this year? I think it's a wait and see at this point, to be honest. Our, our state's here in a state of emer emergency. I don't. I think most states are getting close to that, if not already in that. So probably not going anywhere really soon. And based on what we're seeing from kind of the curve in China, I'm guessing that they're kind of at the top of the curve and starting to come down a little bit. And I think that that whole situation started back in November of 2019. So it's going to be a few months is my guess. Just a guess. I'm no epidemiologist or um, I don't know anything about pandemics, but that's my, my thought is probably no shows this year. All right. Uh, Brennan asks, can I use HDMI for trigger record on the Mix Pre 6.2 while also using Tentacle Sync? Uh, yeah, there are separate ports. So yes, you can. The setup I'm trying to do is an FS7 into a mix pre via HDMI, tentacle sync on FS7 for audio timecode, and tentacle on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Yeah, I think that should work fine. I don't see any problems with that. Um, you'll have the mix pre jammed already, so... Um, I mean, the, the, the tentacles will be jammed to the mix pre. You'll have one on the FS7, one on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. I think that should work fine. I don't see any problems with that. So there we go. Morning, Mark. Thanks for joining us. All right, uh, Klaus, with a lot of countries shutting down due to COVID-19, it's amazing that we can still gather around. Yes, that is, I'm really happy about that. And I'm planning to keep this going 
um, through this whole period here. Um, we're sequestered at home. Uh, my daughter was at university. The university has gone to all online classes, and anyone that was relatively close to home was encouraged to go home, which is what she's done. Um, they've had a. They've had. Uh, today they found the first case at the university and in the the city closest to me here in Salt Lake. Um, I think we've got at least 14 confirmed cases, so probably a lot more in, in the county that I'm in, which is not Salt Lake County. We've already got six or eight cases as well. So um, we're going to stick at home and we're going to do our best to keep in touch with everyone via live streams. All right. Uh, Michael Ray, is there a reason I can't use my Roadlink radios as camera hops? Latency, maybe. There's uh, the the actually the road links are pretty fast. They I believe they have like a four or four point five millisecond latency, which is pretty good. So I wouldn't be too concerned about latency. Um, it depends on what you're doing, though. Remember that the input on the transmitter is a mic level input. So I don't know what you're planning on driving it with, but most outputs. I mean, for most uh, professional grade recorders or even prosumer grade recorders, you should be able to get a strong enough signal into that. And then the output on the other side is mic level, and you should be able to get that back up to the level you need in camera. So it's not ideal from the standpoint that you're doing you're doing reamplification a couple of times, or you're doing amplification a couple of different times. So there's potentially some quality loss there, but I think you could use it, certainly for scratch audio. You could probably make that work. The only thing with the road link is you don't have a lot of control over the input and output levels on the, you, a little bit, but not a lot. You have a switch basically on each one. So I think it, with some experimentation, you could probably get that working. Rob, greetings from Winnipeg. Thanks for joining us today. And Sean from Las Vegas, wishing that everyone uh, stays healthy. Uh, Alejandro, I hope everyone is staying safe in these troubling times we are living. Yes, I, I'm i with you. I hope that everyone's doing well. Use, use good judgment out there, people. Um... Pretty soon, this is the only type of gathering we'll be allowed to do. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, the yeah, uh, for now. Um, but I think we can make the best of this, hopefully, here. So, all right. Everyone says we got the thumbs up on sounding good here at the start. All right. Sounds glorious. That's very, that's kind. <laughs> um, Slav Guns, thanks for joining us. And hello to Ephraim. All right, here's a question from Khalil. Any chance you'll be taking another look at the Sony UDP UWPD series? The D21 seems better than the G4s everyone's accustomed to in the pro sumer market. Um, I do have it on my list, Khalil. I it's a it's a matter of sourcing it and a matter of time. So yeah, I, I do plan. Well, it's on my list, I should say. I don't have any plans in the immediate future, but I think I would like to take a look at it at some point here. Maybe compare it to the G4 a little more directly. So we'll take a look on that. What's your take on the new Sontronics Podcast Pro mic? Um, I I don't know if I know. I think is if that's the one that Bandrew over on Podcastage reviewed pretty recently. Um, doesn't it doesn't sound like an amazing thing, but um, it seemed okay. Um, anyway, I have a, I, I, that, that's all I really know about it is I just saw his review, if that's the one we're talking about here. So I guess my thinking on that is it, um, it's probably okay for a hundred dollars, you know, that, that's a tough, that's a tough price point in some respects. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Different people have different feelings about it. I feel like you get, a, you get a huge quality bump once you get into the, like the 350 or 300, $350 range. Um, and then a lot of the, the mics below that, or it's going to depend on your voice and so on and so forth. So anyway, all right, Klaus, uh, thanks for the answer. Isn't it possible to replace the 3.5 millimeter with an XLR plug? Um, yes, but you have to be careful. So we're back on the Zoom H4n Pro. Um, so here's the thing, the 3.5 millimeter lavalier microphones typically need plug-in power, which is three to five volts. The XLR outputs supply 48 volt phantom power. So you will fry your microphone potentially if you just plug it in using a 
um, I guess what I would call a dumb 3.5 millimeter to XLR adapter. So you can use the adapters that also convert the power down. So one is made by Rode called the VXLR Plus. You need to get the Plus version. So yes, you can do that. Um, there is also, there are several other companies that make them. Um, I believe Sennheiser has one, and I believe Remote Audio has one as well. And so you could probably find those over at the pro audio places like Gotham Sound, True Audio, and the others. So that's something to consider. Yes. So yes, Klaus, you can get those as well. And Alan from SoundSpeed says, consider buying used too. I would agree with that. I, I Here is a question for you, Klaus. Is the form factor of the Zoom H4n, what, is, what, is that what's drawing you to it? Um, because that may be a factor as well. All right, Herberth, hello from Bolivia. Thanks for joining us here. All right, how about having a MixPre 6 Gen 1 with a 7B? Is that enough clean gain? Yeah, definitely. You, you've got 60, or sorry, 76 dB of gain on the MixPre, even the Gen 1 series, and that's plenty for the um, Shure SM7B. And it looks like uh, uh, Alan agrees. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for all the help. Um, and I I would agree with Sean. Thank you, SoundSpeeds, for your channel. Uh, Alan has some great information up on his channel over at SoundSpeeds on YouTube. If you have not seen that before, I definitely recommend you go take a look. He is a uh, professional boom operator and has plenty of experience in the world of working on big-budget TV and film. So definitely lots of great information over there. All right. I own a 416 and been reading everywhere that it is not suitable for indoors. However, to save money, is it worth using Isotope RX-7 to fix the audio? I do have sound blankets too, just FYI. There's, here's the thing about shotgun microphones indoors. You can use them indoors. You run a slightly higher risk that if the audio comes in, the primary source of the audio comes in the side, you'll get some and the front of the microphone kind of at the same time, kind of like basically talking into the side of the microphone that you can get some odd phasing issues, and there's nothing in in Isotope RX that you can do to fix that. It's all coming in on a mono channel, and so it's the damage is done, and there's no great way to fix that. So <clears throat> if you're hanging sound blankets and you're aiming that mic correctly, there's no problem using it indoors. Just be aware and do some experimentation. Turn the mic to the side and speak into the side of it, and as you're turning it, um, pretty you know fairly up close, talk into the side and turn it toward you as you keep talking, and you'll notice some face, there'll, there'll be this kind of warbling sound at some point. That's the type of thing I'm talking about. It's not usually a huge issue. So just as long as you use the microphone correctly, you can definitely use um, a 416 indoors. There's no problem with that. Uh, since NAB has been canceled, will each company reveal any upcoming devices via their websites? If so, do you think they'll have release dates? Um, well, that depends on the company, but yeah, I think they're going to do online uh, announcements. I know Blackmagic has done a lot of that already on the camera side. I assume that sound devices will be doing stuff like that as well. Zaxcom will probably do that as well. Um, they all have that opportunity, so yeah, I think we're going to see some of that. Whether or not they have release dates is another interesting question, and I think different companies treat that differently. Some are more um, enthusiastic about getting the information out about products that they are currently developing versus others who generally don't announce until they're ready to ship. So I think it's going to depend on the company as to whether or not you're going to get information on release dates. So um, something to consider there. So, all right. Uh, so Klaus is considering a sort of a pocket form factor recorder, mostly to record interview interviews, but if possible, also to record other sounds like sound effects. Okay. David also says, I've used 416s indoors plenty of times, and while they are not ideal, you can still get usable dialogue out of them if you keep them on axis. I agree 100%. All right. I have never been successful to set my MixPre 3 Mark 1 to do a mix minus and send audio to an interviewee without them hearing themselves when using Source Connect Now. Um, I'm not familiar with Source Connect Now. On the MixPre 3 Generation 1, it, if you're using it as an audio interface, I believe it is possible using some, some routing. Um, 
it's not super simple, but it is possible. <laughs> and uh, it sounds like we've gotten enough requests on that. I think I'm going to go ahead and, and put together a video to show how to do that. So if you can hang in there, Charles, um, there is a way to do it, I believe. So we'll hopefully come back to that. Let me, in fact, just make a little note here right now while I'm thinking about it so that I remember to consider it. I'm just going to type in mix minus mix pre. Okay, we've got a note now. It's official. It's on the list. Oops. Okay. Good question. Thanks for that. Um, hello to Bill from California. If you were able to purchase the, if I were to purchase the Audio Limited A10s, what levels do you recommend setting on the Zoom F8? I recommend going to line level and sending a line level signal from the receiver on the Audio Limited into your Zoom F8. That would be my recommendation. So, and you shouldn't, and you you shouldn't need to adjust the the inputs too much on that. Um, yeah, because you're just going line level, line level. So. Uh, that would be my recommendation. All right, quick question. What's your opinion on buying a 744T or 788T now in 2020? Ooh. Uh, this is purely opinion. I don't, I don't know if they... I imagine they'd still repair them, but I don't know. They're certainly not... I don't think they're actively selling those anymore. I don't think they're on their current product catalog. Let me just take a look real quick. Yeah, as I thought, they've been removed from the active product catalog some, for some time. Um, if you go to the support page, what I don't know is what the availability of replacement parts and things of that nature. So you'd be tied to sound devices for doing any sort of repair, or, or actually potentially some of the pro sound houses could do it too. Um, I would probably contact them and say, hey, you know, what's the plan for support, like physical hardware support for these um, going into the future? That's what I would do. Um, I think they're great. They're great recorders. I have used the 744T on one project, and it was a fantastic recorder. Um, and if you can pick one up for a good price, that would be a really nice uh, thing there. 36 on the transmitter, Alejandro. Are you serious, Alan? <laughs> That's probably a good starting point for the input level on the is that what you're talking about, the input level on the transmitter? So I don't know. I, I may miss that question. I apologize. Um, should a road mic be good for eliminating road noise? Sorry, bad joke. Har, har, har. <laughs> um, actually, if it's if it's uh, directional, then yes. If you use your polar pattern to your advantage, then yes, it can remove road noise. Oh, thank you, Alan. Alan is, uh, I was referring when we were talking about the stereo wind covers, Sonella is the uh, brand that provides the kind of high-end uh, wind covers. So that is the one to look at as well if you're in that market. Again, not cheap, but they do make some really high quality gear. And yeah, Lloyd also identified it as the Sonella. There's several products, the Piano, Pianissimo, Cozy and Leonard Balls are Sonella wind options. Okay, a question from Trevor. I know this will probably differ from headset to headset, but best guidance for setting headphone gain on MixPre to best judge the proper gain for the microphone. Um, excuse me. I, I, uh, I think you need to find a comfortable level where you can hear things, and you need to be careful not to be blasting it too loud in your ears. Um, so that you're damaging your hearing, but I think that's going to be a really personal setting. So I don't think there is a best gain setting, but there is, uh, you know, the MixPre's headphone amplifier, thankfully, is pretty good. So you should have plenty of range there to get the, the um, you know, the, the in -ear, you know, the basically the headphone <laughs> sound pressure levels where you need them so you can hear everything. So I would be, I would just warn against running it too loud because it's going to be a fatiguing and b it could damage your hearing. So, but you know you don't have to run it super low either. I don't, um, I'm just not sure how to answer that other than that. But get something that's comfortable that you can work in for um, for a long period of time. If anyone has other other advice on that, that would be interesting to hear as well. 
All right. Bill says, I use Audio Limited with Zoom F8. Need to use a quarter inch for the line level. I really love the results I get. Um, great. Yeah. Good point. If you're on the original Zoom F8, then yeah, you will need to use a quarter inch. So you'll need to go XLR a quarter inch to tell the Zoom F8 that this is coming in as line level. On the F8N, you can actually select the XLR as line level as well. So that was an upgrade they made. Actually, yeah, that was that was a hardware upgrade, as I recall. So, um, Rob says that Alex Knickerbocker has a few videos on recording noise outdoors, too. There you go. There's another resource for you. Alex Knickerbocker's got some good information out there on the YouTube channel as well. Um, he does a lot of sound post work, um, but he also gets into recording as well. Curious if anyone has opinions on the use of Resolve versus Ableton for recording. I'm familiar with Ableton, but considering Resolve for Studio Collab. Jason, are you talking about recording music or are you talking about recording uh, stuff for video or film? I'm curious. Um, Resolve does have some, some remote collaboration capabilities, which could be interesting. I don't know if you're, again, if that, that's the reason I'm asking about music is because if you're planning to do music, um, there's not real-time collab. I mean, they call it real-time collaboration, but you couldn't, for example, have two people laying down an audio track, like a guitarist and a bass, a remote bass player, at the same time, I don't think, in Resolve. I don't know. I know that, I believe Pro Tools has some capabilities along those lines. I'm not super familiar with those, just have heard about them. Um, but that's that'd be my first question there. Um, the great thing about Resolve, it's free. You can download it and try it out and see if it works for you. So that's a great thing. Um, David says, for Trevor, on the mix pre's, I usually leave my headphone gain at 80. I usually focus on looking at the levels themselves rather than trusting my ears, but I feel like 80 is decent enough. That's going to differ from headphones to headphones depending on the impedance rating on your headphones. So take that into account as well. Um, 80 could be really hot on some headphones depending on what you're using, <laughs> um, but it could be perfectly fine on others. So just a, a note there. <clears throat> Oh, Lau, uh, thanks for the correction here. So he thinks that the Sennheiser MKH 816 has been out of production, um, but they make the MKH 8070 and also the ME 67. So the 8070 would be like the pro level long shotgun microphone. Uh, when we were talking about those and the ME 67 would be the um, semi-pro, prosumer? Not sure how they characterize that exactly. And also the MKH-70 is the non-modular version of the 8070, 8016, or 816. Okay, so there's some other options there as well. All right, Sheriff Vlogs has a uh, question. Working on big productions like movie, does the sound department send the sound effects to the editor and the editor adds the sound effects to the clips or the editor edits video send the video to the sound department and they add the sound effects and how does the editor sync audio to video if the sound department is going to edit the dialogue for example cutting off the clapperboard sound with the dialogue thanks okay so there are there are a number of questions there <laughs> um so it depends on the workflow but generally my understanding is and again i've i've worked on on smaller budget films i'm not working in like big Hollywood budget films or Atlanta um, big productions and things of that nature. But generally, the, the cinema workflow works like this. Um, a lot of times, the the video editing team, the editorial team, if you will, will have the synced audio. And, and I'm not clear on how they all do this. And I think it differs from production to production. But on the ones I've worked on, they actually sync everything. They sync the poly wave file and they just mute everything except for the stereo mix. So they, they mute all of the individual isolated microphone channels. And the editor just works with that. And then, or or for example, if I didn't if they didn't want a stereo mix, they just wanted the isolated channels, they'll probably just put the boom microphone in there and mute the lavaliers. Um, in some cases, they'll also do their own kind of preliminary mix and they'll choose if they if like, for example, if they prefer the lavalier sound on one, they might choose that. Then when it goes to sound post, that's when they will do that more careful mix and they'll do the cleanup on those individual uh, you know, audio tracks and things of that nature. Um, then that's generally when the sound design is done. So that's when the sound effects are put in. 
um, the Foley is put in, any sort of automated dialogue replacement goes in as well. There is an app called, uh, it's going to escape me, but there's an app that can help with the sync. And I, it, the name is escaping me, I apologize, but there is an app that a lot of the post sound teams use. Um, if, if one of you know it, if you could put it down here in the chat or over here in the chat, <laughs> um, that'd be super helpful. But that's generally how they're going to do it. You can do it manually as well. Just line up the waveforms um, if you're trying to replace, you know, sync up dialogue at least. Um, so there are some thoughts there on that. So thanks for the question. That's a that's a good one. Um, but a lot of that, you know, a lot of the sound effects and all of the sound design, that's done with by the sound post team in post. Um, so that sometimes what editorial will do is they'll put in temporary sound effects. That's not unusual, um, but it's usually going to be the sound design team that really kind of notches it up to the next level. And in many cases, um, they'll just leave notes on the edit decision list or the EDL um, that you get from editorial um, to say, you know, insert, you know, whatever the sound effect is here. Um... Alejandro, thanks, Bill. But if I, what if I want to go XLR mail? I thought the A10s come with an XLR mail cable. They do, Alejandro. I think what what Bill was saying is that on the original Zoom F8, the only way to get line level in is you have to use the quarter inch input. Um, that tells the Zoom F8 that this is a line level signal. There's no other way to switch it on the original F8. So that's why he says he uses an XLR to quarter inch adapter. Hopefully that makes sense. So, okay. Um, Klaus, are you pretty much always loving up your interview subjects? That's an answer. That's a question for Klaus. We'll see what he says. So 36 on the TX, uh, should I keep my RX at zero? Y yeah. Yeah, I, I typically do, I believe. And Alan's probably already. Yeah, okay, Alan agrees there. And yes, unless you need to change for gain staging reasons, yes. So agreed. Oh, and he and he says thanks. Okay, so we got Yeah, okay, we got clarity here. Oh sorry. Bill also says that he has a zoom he thinks that the zoom F8 and you can the XLR can be microline, which is true, yes, confirmed. Um, he has the older F8 where you have to put in quarter inch to get line level. All right. Uh, Trevor, I find myself not going past 60 on my Mix Pre 3.2 using Sennheiser HD 25s. I find past that I'm just getting too much noise. I'm curious, Trevor, are you getting uh, self noise generated by the like the headphones and the the headphone amplifier? Or are you hearing noise that's going into the recording? Because if you're hearing noise that's going into the recording, that's perfectly fine. You want to hear that. That's the whole purpose of monitoring is so you know if you've got noise. Um, but are you saying you're getting like uh, self-noise hiss type of thing, like electronic hiss? That's a different thing. So that's interesting if you are. I'm surprised at that, actually. The, the Mix Pre headphone amps have been pretty good in my experience, and I haven't had a lot of problems. And I don't know what the impedance rating is on the HD25s. I assume it's under 100, so it should be fine, but... Those are some thoughts. Um, back to Klaus's question on the Zoom H4n. It will be my first time, but it's for walking outside while talking, so I'm thinking about Rode Wireless Go for the guest and a Rode Lavalier Go for me or something like that. Okay, that could definitely work. And so Alejandro, back to the Zoom F8. Yes, so you're going to need to convert to quarter inch to tell the F8 that you're coming in line level. Oh, this is good information. Okay, so Alvaro Morello, I believe the Behringer XR18 has auto mix. Good to know. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, is that the one of their big, their like one of their bigger um, live sound remote boxes? Dante based? That I don't know the answer to, but something to look at. Um. Joseph says, I feel like if you've got, if you have five people regularly on a podcast, you should get a Zoom L12. That's not a bad idea. Um, not a bad idea. Or a Zoom F6. That's another option there too. If, um, 
Zoom F6 it has auto mix on it as well. I haven't found that to be quite as effective as the uh, mix assist on the mix pre, but it is definitely helpful. And especially when you get more than two people, like when you get three or four people, that's where I think those really start to make a bigger difference. David Miranda says the F6 also has 32-bit float, and that would negate the need for auto mix entirely too. Well, it does and it does not. It depends on how you look at that. If you're trying to turn around quickly and not have to do a really in-depth um, post mix, then that's where 32-bit float isn't really relevant from my point of view. That's where you probably want to use a record in 24-bit mode using auto mix, so you can you don't have to go in there and clean all that up. Um, 32-bit float will help in cases where people are getting, you know, over-modulating and surpassing 0 dB full scale, and then you'll be able to save that. So, yeah, it's it's kind of a it's a trade-off. Um, in that case, if I'm doing a podcast, I would rather um, I'd rather use auto mix generally than 32-bit float. So, just some thoughts there. Jason, happy Sunday to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Alan says it, it'll perhaps even make it more difficult to edit. 32 bit floating will not help, will help not clip, but won't help you with an even mix track. And, and I agree. That's, I think that's, I think we're talking on the same wavelength there. Um, okay. Klaus, if you're going for the Rode Wireless Go, why not look at the Deity wireless system? It might cover all your needs except driving the SM7B. It's not exactly a, well, I guess the, the XLR plug-on is a recorder, but otherwise it's just a wireless system. But yeah, that, that's another option there. Um, and then David also says, yeah, it depends on which software you use to edit. And, and I think it really depends on which, uh, what he wants his workflow to be. If he wants to do a really careful post mix anyway, then yeah, sure, use 32-bit float. Um, but if you are trying to get that quicker turnaround and use auto mix, um, there's some benefits there. Um, Curtis or anyone, I can't remember offhand, how many inputs does the Scorpio have? Oof. Uh, let's take a look. I don't remember offhand either. But I can tell you here pretty quickly. Uh, the specs, that doesn't mention it there. Let's go to the overview. 16 ultra low noise, 8 series microphone preamplifier. So it's got 18 analog inputs, 32 uh, Dante inputs, 32 channels of Dante inputs, 12 buses, 36 tracks, and also, um, yeah, so that covers it. So there's there's an answer there <laughs> on the Scorpio. If you're going to be doing those productions, um, that's awesome. All right, Klaus, you could collect Deity Microphones HDTX XLR transmitter auto recorders as required. And then sync them in post, I guess. You could do that. <clears throat> Alan says, I want to do some location shooting for my channel, and the guys that normally help me shoot are pretty spooked about leaving their houses. Um, yeah, it's a rough time at the moment on that front. Do you have a 3D printer, and if so, have you found any useful things to print for live location sound? I just got one, and I've been printing nonstop, looking to make some headphone holders soon. Um... Yeah. Uh, I, well, I don't have one, no. Um, but the thing that I've seen most often are um, replacement knobs, especially for the Zoom F series. Uh, so they make bigger knobs for the that stick out a little bit more that are a little easier to access. So that's probably the biggest thing I've seen as far as, um, you know, 3D printing something for, for your sound gear. Uh, but there are lots of other things. Headphone holders are, are a fine thing as well. I think uh, retention clips or, you know, things that... Um, there's, you know, maybe things you could do with the, the headphone knob here on the side, maybe. Um, although Sound Devices has released that, basically the Lego tire to put on there, <laughs> um, which is nice because that makes it just a little easier to kind of roll. I just got to show this here to kind of just roll your finger back and forth like that to adjust the headphone or the menu encoder here on the side. So those are some thoughts. I don't know if anyone else has other ideas there, too. All right. Uh, hard to believe you have a college-age daughter where you a dad at 12. I was not a dad at 12. No. My daughter was born when I was 30, 31, uh, almost 31. 
30 years old. Um, Sniper Sounds, thanks for all the great videos over the years. Thank you. Thanks for the support. Uh, Lawn Justice, I'm having more self-noise in my electrosonic dual unit versus my older UCR211. Why do you think that would be? That's where I'm going to need some help from other people. I don't know. But I know that Electrosonics has really great support. So I would contact them to get their input on that. That would be my first thought. But I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. And Stephen uh, reminds me not to touch my face. Okay. Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Greg asks, is the Shure SM7B a good choice for tabletop interviews? Something better for multi-person interviews around a table? Um, I think it is. Uh, it's a decent choice. It's it's not a, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. Not everyone's voice sounds amazing on the Shure SM7B. Mine is okay on the, I think, on my opinion at least from my ears, it sounds okay on my voice. Um, but it's a pretty dark mic, and if you have a dark voice, I don't think it's an awesome combination necessarily. So that's one thing to consider. But I think overall, you know, it's it's become very calm, is very popular in podcasting, and I think generally the sound is pretty good. Um, so I think it's an okay choice. Are there better choices for multi-person interviews around a table? Um. There, there are a lot of choices out there. It depends on the budget. I would generally go with a cardioid if you're going to be working. And again, and you well know this, Greg, is it working in a, in an untreated space that's not really made for audio recording? I would stick with a dynamic microphone. I think that's going to be easier for the mix. Um, just not picking up quite as much room sound um, and other ambient sound. I think the SM7B is a great choice there. But if you need to do something on a tighter budget, there are lots of other options out there as well. I know. One other that's very popular amongst podcasters is the Samson Q2U. Um, before that, one that was very popular was the Audio Technica AT2005 and the, sorry, ATR2000, sorry, ATR2100 and the AT2005, which were basically the same microphone with just a few minor differences, same voicing, certainly. Um, so those were pretty popular choices as well. I don't, you know, those are, those are okay for budget mics. The thing about the Audio Technica is it's pretty, it had a, kind of a sibilance presence bump that didn't work well for my voice. I It's okay, but um, it can work well on, on darker voices, I think. But those are some thoughts out there on those. But I would generally stick with a cardioid dynamic of some sort. All right, American Liberty, when selecting a microphone, did you ask a question earlier that I missed? And I apologize if I did miss it. I'm not sure I'm seeing it. <clears throat> if you got more, go ahead and let us know. Oh, here it is. When selecting a mic, what is the max self-noise level? Would you say it should uh, stop being considered? Well, hmm. I Well, I like to see something under, certainly under 20 dB A-weighted. Um, but there are some even professional level mics that are sitting up in that range. So it, there are, uh, sorry, I'm touching my face again. I won't touch my face anymore. Um, so those are some things, that that one's a tough one, but I would say under 20 is generally where you want to be. Um, a lot of the, there are a lot of good professional mics that are somewhere in the, say, t minus, the, the 12 to 18 dBA weighted range. So if you can get under 20, I guess, would be, if I'm going to, if I have to choose a number, <laughs> that's what I would say. Um, Klaus, back to the Zoom. It's mostly about the price and the mobility. I'm planning to do some walks outside with a guest and do the interview that way. I don't trust my phone enough to do it. That's fair. Zoom H4 and could do that. Uh, 3D printing on set. <laughs> some good stuff there. Oh, uh, Lloyd brings up something interesting here. Sound Devices have announced the two new battery sleds for the Mix Pre series. Looking forward to any DD announcements as well. So Sound Devices have a couple of new battery sleds here. And I need to look into the, into that in, in more detail. Um, but I think one of them essentially adapts the Mix Pre 3 and 6 to have a Hiroshi input so you can run a... Um, you know, either a battery distribution system into it or a, um, like a Cine battery if you wanted to go on the cheap um, and, and really power it for a long time. So that's one of them. I'm not sure what the other one is, but we'll, have to, we'll take a closer look at that. Thanks, Lloyd, 
for pointing that out. Sound devices, mix pre-mark one or two, which one to buy? Um, the mix, the original ones are discontinued, so I don't think you can buy those new. That would be a question of used versus new. And the the mix pre two is the one that has the um, wide dynamic range, thirty two bit float recording capability. If I were buying today, I'd probably just buy the two. But if you can get a great deal on a Mark one and you don't need the wide dynamic range recording, then I think the Gen one is a good set of you know it's a good product as well. So hopefully that helps there, Eric. David says, the Mark I is a very fine device, but there are a couple of benefits to the Mark II, such as, um, oh yeah, and time code generators in the Mix Pre 3 and 2, or sorry, Mix Pre 3, 2, and 6, 2, which the originals did not have. So that's another important one. Um, so thanks for pointing that out, David. Yes, you're absolutely right. That The time code's another one. Why did you choose audio limited wireless over electrosonics? Are you doing wireless booming? Um, Good questions. Yes. Uh, so wireless booming, yes. And I chose them. I don't know that I have a really good reason for that. I, I went and talked to, uh, what is his name? It was at NAB a couple of years ago. Is it, it's Pi? I can't remember his name, but he's, he's the, uh, he was the lead of um, Audio Limited before they joined Sound Devices, and he still does a lot of the, the trade shows. Um, I like the feature set. Um, I I have to confess, and maybe this is this was a this is one thing that colored my decision a little bit. But I need to go back and look closer at Electrosonics, but because there are plenty of pros that are using Electrosonics, obviously. But I used their original portable digital recorder, the PDR. It's now been discontinued because there was a lawsuit with. Zach's come over it, but the limiter on that was not that impressive. Like I felt like it was really easy to overdrive that limiter. Um, and the audio limited limiter has been fantastic. Um, now I didn't, I, I hadn't extensively tested the audio limited limiter at that point, but I had experience with electrosonics limiter in the PDR. I hadn't used their other wireless products. So um, that was one small thing that I was like scratching my head about a little bit. And on their original PDR, I was also a little off put by, and probably this was just my own expectations, but that original PDR had a time code input that you could jam the device with. But the reality is, is there wasn't an inbuilt, um, uh, like a temperature compensated crystal oscillator in it. So it was just kind of get you in the ballpark kind of audio, which time code, which is actually, you know, not horrible, but it wasn't like the perfect solution in terms of just dropping the audio file lining up via time code and you're ready to go. No, it's more like dropping the audio file, lining up via time code, and then tweaking it and fine tuning it to get it actually back in sync again. So it's it's one of those things that it helps, but it's not perfect. So I was a little soured by that. I don't know why, um, but those are kind of my really bad excuses for why I ended up looking more at Audio Limited. I've been super happy with the Audio Limited, by the way. Um, Alan, I know you use Audio Limited as well. Um, but anyway, it's been working really, really well for me. Uh, Alan says they're both great machines. They're still serviceable and solid as a rock. With oh, okay, you're talking here about the Mix Pre. Oh wait, maybe you're not. Maybe I'm not sure what you're talking about there, Alan. I don't know if that's in regards to Electro or if that in and versus Audio Limited or if you're talking about Mix Pre. I don't think the big mixers are using Mix Pre's as their main mixer, at least. <laughs> All right. WYSICOM came out with a quad receiver. I don't know if it's available yet. So far, they are the only ones I know that have something in the works. It would be so cool if I can do a rev if uh, you can do a review once it's out. Wow. We'll have to see about getting that. <laughs> I think you're going to have to have an antenna system as well with that because that's a lot of channels in a really small space. Uh, Greg notes that the headphone level of 80 is a percent is a good starting point. Again, be careful with that. Just, you know, it depends on your headphones a little bit. If it's uncomfortable at 80%, you're, it's okay to drop it down. Um, but yeah, that could be a good starting point. Have you ever used Reaper? I've used Pro Tools, and it can be frustrating getting random errors and crashes on Mac OS. Um, yes, I have used Reaper many, many years ago. Um, I was on Windows at the time when I used it, um, and I just let my 
I just never updated my license. So, but it's a it's a pretty impressive DAW for its price. Um, they've done a lot of work on that, and it it's pretty cool. There has yet to be a really clear clear video showing how to do a mix minus on a mix pre. There have been a few videos published, but none have done a good job of it. Would love one from you if possible. Okay, it's on the list. Okay, and Jason was looking kind of general, but more music. Okay. Um, so we're going to need to wrap up here pretty soon. <laughs> my voice, I've got some allergies at the moment, and so my voice is kind of starting to waver a little bit, but um, sorry about that in advance. What device do you use to capture HDMI from your camera for streaming? I'm using a Blackmagic ATEM Mini. Uh, Bill, I chose the Audio Limited for the value it offered at the time of purchase. I do use it for a wireless boom at times. I have four channels total and plan on staying at four. Yeah, I think it, that was another thing that it was um, planning on using it as a, for a boom as well. So, uh, Lloyd says, I have the Sennheiser 280 Pro and Mix Pre 6.2. My headphone level is 68. And, and he agrees that it would also probably vary with different headsets. Thoughts on the stage ninja? I don't, uh, Stephen, I think I just saw your email uh, just before I got on. So I haven't had a chance to look at the stage ninja yet, uh, but I will take a look at that. Ahmed uh, from Egypt, you're saying, hi, I'm using an F8 with line level by XLR and it's going fine. Is that an F8N or the original F8? I thought at the F8 originally you had to use a uh, quarter inch, but I'm not, I, if you know that for sure, go ahead and confirm for us. I appreciate that. All right. I've been planning on moving to a sound devices mixer for some time. Audio Limited integrates well with sound devices. That's another reason as well. Electro does as well, though. I mean, if you're using one of those slot-in systems, um, that does as well. But I think there may be some advantages with the uh, with the Audio Limited as well. There's some opportunities there at least. So. What are the first strong points you can think of when comparing WYSICOM, Lectro, Zaxcom, and Audio Limited wireless systems? I think Zaxcom, the clear benefit there is that it integrates very well with their mixers, so you can control the, the transmitters from the mixer, which is amazing. And in fact, that's uh, they own some patents on that, which is what's made it difficult for the other companies to replicate that capability. Um, they also have the recording on the transmitter packs, to a um, to a, a format they call, or to, with using a technology they call Never Clip. It's not the same as 32-bit float we're seeing on some of the newer recorders in the prosumer range, but it is a similar type thing where you basically get like 136 dB of dynamic range, so you generally aren't going to clip a lavalier microphone for sure. Oh, well, the microphone will, will have problems before the transmitter will, in other words. Um, but it records it to a format called MARF, which is Mobile Audio Recording Format. So you do have to decode that in post and um, if before you start editing with it. Um, that's the one thing I know. WYSICOM is relatively new in the United States, and I haven't used any of their gear yet. Um, but they've been, they've been operating for a long time in Europe and other areas of the world. Electrosonics is probably the biggest one here in the United States. They've been operating for a long, long time, making top quality gear that most of the big productions rely on to, to till today so they're very um, well regarded in that that way um, they're super tough gear they, they stand up really well they have really good strong support uh, infrastructure and repair services audio limited is also relatively new in the united states within the last few years but now they're associated with sound devices um, in from my point of view the uh, we've talked a lot about Audio Limited here already today, so there's some advantages there. I think Audio Limited has an A10 rack, which allows you to put in I think four different dual channel receivers, and it has the antenna system. Um, and I think you can control some things with some of the higher end mixers using that. Um, it also has Dante outputs, so there's some things there on the Audio Limited system that are interesting. Um, for me, the reason I chose Audio Limited partly is because I, I got the digital output that I could go straight into my um, sound, devices, sound devices, uh 633 and now my 888. Um, I think the other, I think a lot of the others 
can probably, I think some of the others can do that as well. Not positive, but I think the Electros, you might need an additional plate to do that. And it depends on whether you're using their newer digital system or if you're using their, <clears throat> um, the older uh, hybrid system. So uh, WYSICOM, I'm just not as familiar with their product line, so I don't have a lot I can say about them. So um, Audio Limited A10 is a digital system, so that's a little bit different. So it's actually sending a digital signal. So the, the advantage there, that's one of the things that I actually really liked about it and was a, was a factor in why I chose it was that it does the analog to digital conversion at the transmitter, sends it the digital signal, and then you can send that digital out directly into your recorder. So you don't have to do this multiple analog to digital conversion, you know, back to analog and then back to digital again in your mixer. So that was one thing that was important to me. Uh, Pluralize does audio sync. I th yeah, it does, but I think in the context of post, they're using a different tool. There's another tool that's used there when you're just trying to line up um, one track in a session that's already started. So I think Pluralize is more of a front end type of thing. Before you start the edit, you would generally do the sync. Um, all right. Alonzo, sorry I won't be able to meet you in person, and I just want to wish you and your happy, you and your family are going to be okay. Stay safe. Don't underestimate COVID. Greeting from Italy. Yes, Italy has been hit so hard. Um, stay safe there too. All right. Um, going back to the conversation we had earlier about the cinema workflow. So dailies get the mix track. Um, assistant post dialogue editor will prep and lay out all the tracks and the dialogue editor will listen to them and see if they need ADR or scrub the tracks. So there's some more information about the post workflow. That's interesting. Um, Geek Homeward. Sound devices recently raised all the prices on their mixers, including the 633. Yes, that is true. Um, they do that periodically based you have to kind of adjust for inflation. And so I think that's that's part of what they're they're doing there. That's not the first time that's happened. And if you're used to buying consumer gear, don't ever expect the pro gear general. Well, generally don't expect pro level gear to decrease in price over time unless you're buying used. Um, those niche companies generally aren't moving the volumes where they can get those, you know, those huge benefits from scale. So just a interesting one. All right. Scott says Zoom H6 got a great price on sale, comes with stereo head. And my CAD, you can use or not. So there's another one for Klaus there. All right, back to the post workflow on Cinema. Then they add those tracks to and prep to mix. Dialogue editor will edit the dialogue and then all the effects and music added. This is all part of the sound post team. Editing will only happen after picture lock. Picture lock. <laughs> um... I understand that's quite a joke, and in, in a lot of the productions I've worked on, it's been a little bit of a joke, too. They say picture lock, but then there's still edits after that sometimes. So anyway, um, HDR25 have 70 ohm impedance if memory serves, and David just confirmed. I guess noise was a poor word choice. I guess I would better describe the audio as not sounding natural at higher headphone gain levels. Yeah, if they're not, if they're, if definitely if they're pushing your eardrums that you definitely want to back off there. Um, Lloyd is saying that I believe the Behringer X32 series has auto mix as well, and there's a Dante adapter card available. Okay. Good to know. So there's some options there. Those are the bigger systems, though. I, I gather that Felix was looking for something with fewer inputs, but yeah. Um, a lot of the... I've noticed a lot of the digital boards now, the like the, um, the front of house and... Uh, like sound reinforcement boards, a lot of the digital boards now are coming with auto mix features. I know my Allen and Heath SQ5 has an auto mix feature as well. So it's pretty cool to see them adding all those things. Uh, the Audio Limited A10 transmitter does have the ability to provide phantom power. Yes, that is correct. And we got several confirmations. All right. <laughs> um, do you have any suggestion for a 5.1 sound card? Most of them have stereo out. Mine to do 5.1 in Vegas Pro using the Adams Audio. Uh, well, I'm using the Universal Audio Apollo X6, which can do a 5.1 mix. 
Um, I haven't looked into that a whole lot, so I'm not doing surround mixing at this point. All my mixing is stereo, um, but I did buy the X6 so that I could grow into a 5.1 system at some point here. Um, but if anyone else has recommendations, definitely put them in the chat or in the comments. Is it possible to record surround 5.1 of room tones in atmosphere using inexpensive mics? I suggest using large diaphragm condensers. Oh, sorry. Is that a question? Yeah, it's a question. I suggest using large diaphragm condensers in double mid-side modes, for example, Rode NT2A and two Rode NT1As. Well, you can record ambisonics and then convert to a 5.1 mix in post. Um, I'm not, I don't know that there are, there's really like a, such a thing as a microphone setup that is 5.1. It's more like you can do it, you can do an ambisonic recording or you can do a stereo recording. Um, you can do a mono recording and then in post you mix it to a 5.1 format is my understanding. So that's, that's the approach I think there. Uh, I can only see using a Scorpio on a reality shoot, but for but uh, shoot or bug, but production at the same time it sounds very excessive. <laughs> it depends. Um, room tone in five one. Why? <laughs> yeah, I don't know that you'd necessarily want to get room tone in five one. I think in an ambient recording, like again, that's where I am, ambisonics I think makes more sense more for outdoor nature scapes and things of that nature. Okay, we saw that from Sheriff Logs. Um, if you're recording 360 sound, consider a 360 mic. Rode sells one for about a thousand called the Soundfield NTSF1. Um, it sounds really good, and I know SoundFX recorders uh, that use them. There's also the Sennheiser Ambio is another one in that market. But yeah, that's that's what I was talking about as well. Have you tried any point source audio mics? I've heard some good things about them, and I'm curious if they're able to stand up to the Countryman B6s that I usually use for theater. Uh, no, I have not used any point source audio mics. If anyone else has, I'd be curious to hear about them, in fact. So it sounds like there's some lavaliers, and it sounds like you're doing some theater work. That is cool. That is uh, my respect. It's basically uh, front of house sound, and that's challenging, I would think. Uh, I think the new sound device's battery sleds are rebadged Hawkwood sleds. They look identical to the units Hawkwoods released back when the mixed pre's were first released. Interesting. Could be. You would like, uh, Alejandro would like for Deity to do a wideband unit. I would too. So a UHF unit, I, I completely agree. Speaking of batteries, how reliable is USB-C for powering the mix pre and a couple Deity receivers? It seems a good deal cheaper than a battery distro. Yeah, it, it's, the, it's the less expensive option. What you don't get necessarily though are the isolation features that come with most of the battery distribution systems. So once you get a lot of stuff going in a bag, things can start to get kind of hairy and you can end up with um, interference, you know, devices interfering with each other and creating hum and buzz and stuff like that. That's what a battery. That's part of what a battery distribution system does for you, that a USB-C battery may or may not do for you. So just one thing to consider there. Um, the only problem I have with the USB-C connectors is not locking, so it's technically possible to pull it out. On the mix pre, it's pretty firm. I haven't had that problem, and if it's a, you know securely in a bag and you have a battery sled on there for backup as well, you'll just need to keep an eye on it just to make sure that if you do pull the, the uh, USB-C cable out and you move over to the internal batteries, that you notice that and actually make the correction and get the USB-C plugged back in. Um, just a thought there. But um, those are some things about USB-C versus battery distribution. All right, people, I apologize. My voice is just about had it. I know there's some more um, comments here. I apologize. I don't quite have the voice to get to them just now, um, but come back next week. We will definitely have a session again next week. And in the meantime, get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you again soon.